Step one, I admit that I am powerless over my sin nature and that my life has become unmanageable. Step two, I believe that God can restore me to sanity. Step three, I put my complete trust, faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Step four, I need to make continually a moral inventory of myself in the light of the Word of God. Step five, confessing my specific sins to God, I call on a brother or sister in Christ to share the burden of those sins in prayer and watchfulness over me. Step six, understanding that all my sin is forgiven in Christ, I ask God for daily cleansing from any sins I allow into my life. Step seven, I establish a lifestyle that will help me avoid sinful behavior. I ask for God's help daily for strength to resist temptation. Step eight, I will do all in my power to make amends to everyone I have harmed in my life, except where doing so would injure them or others, seeking their forgiveness. Step nine, following the example of Christ who has forgiven me, I will forgive all the people who have harmed me. Step 10. I do not make excuses for my sinful behavior, but rather promptly confess all sin to God and anyone else against whom I have sinned. Step 11. I seek to improve my relationship with God through prayer, Bible study, meditation on God's Word, and interaction with other Christians, especially in my local church. Step 12. I seek to help others come to a biblical knowledge of God and His saving and sanctifying power. To that end, I will endeavor to be an example of the wonderful grace of God, living a life of obedience to Him and of service to others in His great love. So here in Lesson 7, we're going to try to take a step from Step 6 into Step 7, we need to take this understanding that we now have that our sin is forgiven in Christ. And if you're not sure about that, you still need to go back and make sure that you understand that the only way to have sin forgiven is to have faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. So we ask, for, uh, ask God to cleanse us daily from the sins that do come into our lives. But of course, we want to step out of that. We want to step out of that, uh, that lifestyle. And so as step seven tells us, we want to establish a lifestyle that will help me avoid sinful behavior. These things don't just happen because we wake up one day and say, uh, I should be a different person, I should act differently. You must establish some parameters in your life in order for these things to take hold. We are very much creatures of habit, and a lot of times we need to establish some new habits, a new lifestyle completely. That has to come from a lot of help from God. And so you ask God's help daily, for strength to resist temptation. We're going to look in this lesson, we're going to begin looking in this lesson at a passage of scripture that talks about the, the fact that we have a foundation of faith in Christ, but then it goes into some ways that we can build on that foundation. Some things that need to be put together with our faith foundation to give us the strength and the ability to resist the temptation and have the lifestyle that we know that will be pleasing to God. So we're going to study now a little bit of uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. If you have not done so before in these lessons, I encourage you now to get your Bible, have it open, have it with you as we study this. Part of the reason is we will have some of the verses on one slide, other verses on another slide, even of this same passage. And I always want people to verify that what I'm telling them is coming from God's Word. It's not just something that I'm making up or something that I think should be this way. So we have here in Second Peter chapter 1, and I'll be using the ESV during this study, the translation that I'll be using of the Bible. If you use a different uh, translation, you may see some word uh, differences, but the differences will not be differences of meaning. They will just be other ways of expressing the same thing. So I just want you to be aware of that as we read. Let's start here in Second Peter chapter 1 with the first verse where Simon Peter says that he is a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. And he writes to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. Uh, King James calls it like precious faith. So the great, special, precious faith that we do have 
is the same as the one that the apostle Simon Peter had. There's no no difference in our standing. There are not greater Christians and lesser Christians. There are not Christians who have uh, more of the righteousness of God applied to their position, their standing before God. We're all equal in that sense, and the the help that is available to one is available to all. He continues talking about that. He says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. How? In the knowledge of God and of our of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted, granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. A lot of words there, but a lot of very beautiful things told us. First of all, we, we see the negative again, of course, that there is a corruption in the world because of our sinful desires. Our sin just is a corrupting influence in so many different ways. However, there is divine power. There is grace and peace that can be multiplied through the knowledge of God and of Jesus. All right, his th this ex this expression is just uh, one of the most wonderful things that, that a person in need could ever hear. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. In other words, it's available. You might feel sometimes completely powerless. You might feel at times where there's no way you can attain to the life that God is obviously requiring of you. But understand that though we do fall and though we do fail and though we uh, don't always take advantage of it, this power, this divine power, this the power that is absolute that God has grants to us the ability to live a life that is a life of godliness. Now that comes, he continues on in that passage, through the knowledge of him, the knowledge of whom? The one who called us. The knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us precious and very great promises. So the one who was nailed to the cross and who said, if I be lifted up, I will call all men unto me, the knowledge of him, uh, the, we'll talk about that, what that means in, in a little bit, but the knowledge of him is essential uh, to gaining this power that leads to life and godliness. And he's called us to it. He's called us to receive his own glory and excellence, to, to live a life that is exemplified by his glory and his excellence. And he has promised this. He has granted it to us. He's promised us such great and precious things. And he says that he's given us these great promises so that through them, through the things that he has promised to do, for, through, and with us, so that through them ye may become partakers, listen to this language, that ye may become partakers of the divine nature. Now, no one's going to say here that uh, we're going to become sinless in this life. The Bible is very clear. We've talked about that already in some previous lessons. We've talked about the fact that we're all sin, sinful. We all have the nature and we all have the tendency and it just, it happens. It's, it's going to continue to happen in our lives. But he tells us here that through believing in these promises, taking hold of the promise that his power is available for us to live the right kind of life, to live a godly life, that we can partake of the very nature of God. Unfortunately for us, while we're still in this world, we're going to have the two natures fighting against each other. And I, I, I love the old illustration that I heard, heard many, many years ago of a, a gentleman who had worked with Native Americans for many years in, in a missions effort. And he said he was talking to one of them one day who had accepted Christ as his Savior. And he said, how's, how's that going for you? How's the uh, life of trying to live for Christ? How is that? He says, sometimes it's hard. And the, the missionary asked him again, he said, well, in what way is it hard? Can you explain uh, the sensation or how, how that feels? And 
he said, well, I feel like that there's a black dog and a white dog inside of me and that they're fighting all the time. He's talking about the two natures and how they do battle one with the other. And the missionary asked him the question, he says, which, which dog wins? And the, the very wise answer came back, the one I feed the most. And that's exactly the way it is in our lives as well. The divine nature is available to us. It's in us if we become uh, a believer in Jesus Christ. We become uh, a part of his family. Uh, we are partakers of that divine nature. And he goes on to say that we have escaped from the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desire. Again, unfortunately, we would love to say that we've escaped completely from ever participating in anything that is sinful, that is not of the divine nature. But that has a lot to do with us. That has a lot to do with the choices we make. It has to do with which of those dogs we feed the most. And so uh, there are a lot of keys here to how we can live uh, victoriously over whatever sin we might need to defeat. And in particular, what we're talking about, of course, with addiction has a lot to do with this lifestyle, with this taking the standing where we are and moving on into the proper lifestyle that is pleasing to God. Peter goes on to say, for this very reason, in other words, because of all the things that we've seen up to this point, for all of the, the help that is available, because of all of the uh, power that God has made at our disposal to live a godly life, for this reason, now comes your part. <laughs> for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Now, we're going to go through each one of these words in subsequent lessons. I just want you to get them in your mind right now and consider them. Uh, supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For the reasons that have already been stated, for the availability of help from God, that the, the great and precious promises made by God to us in this area, based on that, Peter says, look, here's what you need to do. You need to start with faith, You've got to start there. You've got to have the belief in the Lord Jesus Christ in order for this to even be available to you. But when you get that, you need to add these other uh, other conditions into your life. When you say, but, but I can't do this. I can't make it. It's too hard for me. It's too strong for me. 1 Corinthians um, chapter number 10 talks to us about this concept of temptation. And uh, in the chapter, he gets down to chapter 12, and, and he throws out, again, the negative side of it. Let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. In other words, be careful that you don't think that you're something, that you're capable. I, I've, I've heard people who are going through addiction problems as well uh, come to the place where I can do this. I'm just going to grab hold of it. I'm going to get rid of this thing out of my life. The Apostle Paul is talking about it under inspiration of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 10. And he says that just you need to be careful. If you think you have the strength to do something like this in, in, in yourself and on your own, you have, you're standing in a, in a position where you may be falling soon. But then he goes on with, again, the good news. If, you, if we just stop thinking that I've got to do this myself and look at all these things that Peter has lined out for us here in this chapter, Paul also says this in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 10. He says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. In other words, don't think you're the lone ranger in all of this. And you know, you know, whatever your uh, addiction may be, you know that there are other people who have been imprisoned by this same addiction. All right? There's nothing that's not common to man. We all fight with these issues, with these uh, uh, desires that are that are for things that we shouldn't have, or at least in a way that we shouldn't have them. And he, but he says that there's it's common. It's to all of us. And then he continues though. He said there again, we all we all have these problems, but God is faithful. What a statement! God is faithful. We know what faithfulness means. I think we understand that. That means that we can be counted on. 
If you say, yeah, that's a faithful friend, you, you mean that that friend, no matter what comes up, even if you do something wrong, even if you do something stupid, if they're a faithful friend, they're still going to stand by you. Well, God is faithful. God is 100% faithful. And he makes us promises, as we've already talked about in Second Peter. Here he says God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. All right, now, it sounds like it's all us, and there's definitely a part of it that is us. You will, he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Now listen to this part, though. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it, or you may be able to get through the temptation without succumbing to it, without without falling into that temptation. So here we have both sides of it in one, one verse. God is faithful, and he will not let things come upon you beyond what you can deal with, but he's going to also be the way that you deal with it. With the temptation, he will also, he will also provide the way of escape. Now, now, notice that. He's providing a way. He's not reaching down and pulling you completely out of the moment of temptation. The last phrase in the verse says that you, you may be able to endure it. So in other words, temptations are going to come. We're going to have to face them, and we're going to have to get through them, but we can if we'll look for God's way. There will be a way. If you're standing before a temptation at this moment, there is a way. Uh, it may be different in each situation, but God will provide you. Again, back to the, the illustration I've been using, the two doors in front of you, you choose. Well, this one's a lot easier, sure, but is it the right one? Is the temptation door the right one, or is the door that God has provided over here, which may be hard? It may require me to do much more than I have ever done before to avoid going through the door of temptation, but God has provided a way. Let's understand that. And so back to to Second Peter chapter one, uh, again, we need to add some things into our faith. We need to have some things that are going on in our lives on a daily basis that give us the understanding and the direction to choose the right path, the way that the Lord has provided for us to escape and endure the temptation. As I said earlier, we're going to look at each one of those qualities that were just mentioned. And uh, before we get to that, though, let's take a look at what these things can actually do for us. Here, as we continue in Second Peter 1, he says, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We, we need knowledge. We need to know him. We need to understand uh, as much as our finite minds can who Jesus Christ is, but we need a knowledge that is experiential based. We need to know him as a person, as a reality in our life. We need to, to know not only who he is, but what he is like, what he is capable of, what our relationship with him is. Otherwise, he says, if these things are not uh, increasing, if they're not existent and increasing in our lives, then we are kept from, not from being saved, not from being children of God, not from having eternal life, but we are kept from being effective. We are kept from being fruitful. And those of you who have struggled with either an addiction or even just possibly a, a certain sin that just seems to crop up so many times in your lives, you know the sensation of making the wrong choice and looking back at it and saying, if I hadn't done that, how much more I could have done for the cause of Christ, how much more I could have done to help someone else in their walk, either to the Lord or with the Lord. We don't want to be ineffective or unfruitful in our knowledge. You can know all the data, all the details about the life of Jesus Christ here on this earth. You can know all of the biblical teachings about him and still not have an effective, fruitful life in that knowledge. But he says, if these qualities that he just lined out are yours, and if these things are 
increasing. In other words, you're exercising them and allowing them to take deep root in your life, then they'll keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful. In other words, they'll make you effective. They'll make you fruitful. That the knowledge that you have, both uh, both the academic knowledge and also the experiential knowledge that you have of Jesus Christ, can be effective and it can bring forth fruit. And then he goes on to tell us what happens so many times for whoever lacks these qualities. If you're not allowing these things to develop in your life, and he, again, remember, he's talking to believers here. He's talking to people who have come to faith in Jesus Christ. Whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his for, former sins. Oh, so many times, so many times we stand before a temptation. We don't have the development and the growth of these so important qualities in our lives to show us and, and to make the choice clear and easy. You stand before the two doors and you you can't tell uh, sometimes as clearly as you should at least which door is actually the best door. A lot of times it's clear. A lot of times it's clear. But our sins cloud our judgment then. We've forgotten that we've been cleansed from the former sins and now we stand before the opportunity to either sin or not in this present moment. What are we going to do? Are we blinded because we have not allowed this knowledge to become effective and fruitful? Therefore, brothers, he says, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. Now, some people take this to to speak of uh, make sure that you are saved. And he goes, on, he goes on to say, if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. There are those who talk about falling out of salvation, falling from your calling and the election. Election is a concept that means that you're part of the body of Christ. You're, you belong to him. Uh, if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. He's talking to brothers in Christ. And we know from scripture in many places that this is eternal life we're talking about. So it doesn't have an end. But he says, you need to confirm your calling and election. It doesn't mean that you even necessarily have to make sure that you have it, although that's a, a good thing to check on and a good thing to think about if you're not sure. But the concept that he's bringing out here is practice these things, put these things, these qualities into practice in your life, confirming by what you do that your faith is real. In other words, <laughs> Walk the walk. You talk the talk, walk the walk. If you're truly a born-again child of God, then let these important qualities that God wants to give you come in and let them increase and grow in your life to keep you from falling into that temptation, whatever it may be. He goes on to say, for in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ a rich entrance into eternity. Uh, some people, look. it seems, some people are going to get there by the skin of their teeth. They're going to have their sins forgiven. And that's wonderful. I mean, we could bring to mind the thief on the cross who cried out to the Lord for forgiveness in, in his last moments. We know they were truly his last moments, though some people would hang on a cross for many days before dying. On this particular day, there was a Sabbath coming on, and uh, so the Roman soldiers, in order to not incite the Jews to any more uh, any more problems uh, during this time, they went around and broke the legs of those who were still alive on the crosses so they could no longer push themselves up against the nails in their feet and get extra breath to stay alive just that much longer, a human tendency. We know that Christ uh, allowed himself to expire. He gave back to his father his spirit. Instead of being killed, he actually gave up his life. And so his legs were not broken when they came to him. He was, he was already dead. But the thief on the cross then, on the very day that he was crucified and on the very day that he would die because of the breaking of the legs, cried out and said, Remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus understood what he said and understood his heart and said, this day you will be with me in paradise. And he said, this day, that very day, knowing that the 
thief was going to die that day and that he himself was going to die that day. I'm not sure that the thief understood that yet, but we do know that Jesus knew. And so that day that happened. Now, that man, we don't know really anything about his life except that he admits while he's on the cross to have done some things wrong. He says to the other thief who was mocking, he says, what's wrong with you? We're the ones that deserve this. So, I mean, he at least felt like he deserved punishment. Uh, and here he is being punished and he's crying out for mercy. So we know or we know that most likely his life was not a rich life in effective and fruitful uh, following of God. So he was able to go to paradise with the Lord. He was able to enter into eternal life. And that's wonderful. But it doesn't seem that he would be able to have a rich entrance into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I, I want to, I assume probably you as a believer do too, I want to enter in with uh, my hands full of fruit, things that I've been able to do in his name and for him and through his power, not so that I can have any great acclaim when I get there, but as a way of saying thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for me. And what 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 is there? What else is there but to serve him? What else is there but to ask him to free us from temptation and free us from addiction and free us from everything that would hold us back from being effective or fruitful in this life that we're living here on this earth so that when we do enter into his presence, when we do enter into the eternal kingdom of our Lord, that we can do so giving back to him the fruits of the power and the grace and the mercy and all of these qualities that he's allowed to come into our lives so that we've made the right choices in following him. So once again, take some time with our discussion questions. If you want to take a moment here to pause this, there'll be two more slides with questions. Uh, this one then you can stop and maybe write these down and then go back over the passage of Scripture that we've been talking about primarily in Second Peter chapter 1. Go over these different concepts and see if you can see what, what is being said from them and about them and where this leads us to. So again, take a few moments with this part and then we'll move on to the next slide. This is a very straightforward question, so we want to list the qualities that Second Peter 1 says we need to be adding into our life of faith. Finally, we have one simple question here, one blank to fill in. We want to look at uh, 2 Peter 1 and verse 8 to answer this question, to, to insert into that blank your answer to this. As always, please get in touch with me if there's something I can do for you. If you need to, to speak with me or someone else, please uh, email us at fbclebanon at gmail.com, fbclebanon at gmail.com. And if you just want to put my name in the subject line, then that uh, email will get forwarded on to me. And then we will get in touch and we will have a discussion about how we can better help you in your process here. In the next lesson, we're going to start with the first uh, quality that we saw in that passage that we need to add to our faith. We're going to talk about what it means to have virtue.